Welcome everybody to our uh, financial planning workshop. Uh, these workshops are put on by the American Association of Individual Investors uh, and also sponsored by the Los Altos Library. As Al has already explained, we're not doing this from the library tonight because the, uh, they have a construction issue with the room we normally use. And I apologize that we've had to uh, reschedule this for a Thursday evening instead of the usual Wednesday. Anyway, my name is Fred Smith. I'm a uh, financial planner and a, uh, a registered investment advisor. I retired last year. Uh, and I've given you my email address here uh, so that if any of you have questions uh, that, you know, that come up or comments or agreements with what I'm saying, disagreements, whatever, feel free to email me and I'll, I'll try to get back to you. I've already given, I've also given you the uh, the uh, website for our local chapter, the www.siliconvalleyaii.org. The slides are already there, uh, are already up on that, not just for, for tonight's workshop, but also all the previous ones. And the recordings from the previous ones are there already. And as Al has uh, just explained, the recording for uh, tonight's workshop will be up uh, shortly. OK, so let's move on. Um, these workshops started last uh, September. Uh, we initially did four workshops uh, dealing with the, the various aspects of investing. And then uh, that was followed up by uh, earlier this year, January, February, or March, I guess, by three workshops on uh, retirement, retirement planning and uh, uh, safe withdrawal rates from your retirement portfolio, and stuff like that. Uh, last month, uh, we covered Social Security and Medicare. And tonight is the last of, of the series of nine uh, when we're, uh, we're going to be uh, dealing with estate planning. And right up front, I want to put the disclaimer in, I am not an attorney. Uh, you know, there will be some very important decisions that you guys may need to make regarding estate planning. And these are all, all uh, critically important. And you should really, really, really talk to an estate planning attorney before you make any any uh, major decisions because I am not an attorney and I do not want to uh, find myself in a position of uh, practicing law without a license there. That would not be good for any of us. Overview for what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, we're going to start off with the, with the normal estate planning documents, the will and the trust and the various durable powers of, or powers of attorney and letter of intent. And I'm going to be covering those more from the layman's aspect than, uh, than giving you the spiel that you've possibly heard from uh, uh, you know, attorneys uh, before. You know, it'll be a somewhat uh, different uh, view of them, probably. I want to spend a few minutes on the California's End of Life Option Act, because uh, that was uh, enacted last year, and it has some important uh, implications and also some important limitations I want to discuss. And a, a significant portion of tonight's workshop is, is going to deal with the, the practical considerations of uh, being uh, an, an executor or a trustee and what's involved in, uh, in actually taking care of all this. I mean, it sounds, sounds great to me, and it's an honor to be nominated to do it, but uh, there's a lot of work involved, and you need to understand what that is before you uh, blindly accept it. I'll also be spending a few minutes on uh, the digital world that we live in now and, and, and how you deal with that. And then finally, we're going to end up tonight with a discussion of what I call here your All About Me folder. And at the earlier workshops, particularly uh, workshops one and two, we, we discussed some of the items that should go into a folder. Uh, there was the uh, personal investor profile, the PIP, that basically defines who you are as an investor and what... Uh, you know, it, it, it answers the who am I question. And then the second document from workshop two is the investment uh, policy statement, the IPS. And that answers all the other questions, the, who, the, the where, what, when, why, and how, uh, and all of that. And it's important that, uh, you know, that those documents be part of, of, of the folder that we started back then, but they will also, they should also, you know, be in the folder we're talking about tonight. In tonight's folder, we're going to be adding so much additional material that you're probably going to need a four-inch ring book rather than just a simple little folder. But we'll get to all that later. Oh, I should emphasize again, this, this is a workshop. I, 
you know, please feel free to ask whatever questions are on your mind. If something's not clear to you, uh, use your chat window you know, to, to, to query it because uh, if I'm not making myself clear to one person, chances are some other folks may be having uh, some issues with it as well. So uh, you know, we, we welcome your questions. Don't be shy. We start off with looking at why people don't uh, get involved with estate planning as early as they should. Uh, one of the major reasons is that folks just frankly don't like to think about death or to talk about death. Other issues said that they don't want to discuss all this with their heirs. You know, the, uh, a lot of parents, you know, even even with adult children, are very uh, reluctant uh, to discuss uh, you know, financial matters you know, in either direction. You know, when, the, when the kids are real little, the parents don't mind giving them guidance, but as the parents get older and the children become adults, uh, there should be a, a reciprocal arrangement going on there, and, and it, it very often does not happen. And that's one of, one of the uh, inhibitors uh, to uh, 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 estate planning and why people tend to avoid it. Uh, the old hoary, I'm too busy, is always in there. Uh, also, some folks think that their estate just isn't big enough. Um, that's a, 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 a wrong way to look at it because, frankly, estate planning involves a lot more than just the, the, the financial aspects and, you know, of how much your estate is worth. And there, you know, there are a whole bunch of other things that uh, enter into this. And uh, you, know, the, you need to... Uh, Get involved with estate planning at an early age, uh, so that people know uh, know your wishes. Uh, one of the problems is that some folks just haven't figured out yet how they want to distribute their assets, or you know if they have minor children, they they, they haven't quite decided uh, you know who they will want as guardians. But it's better to uh, you know sit down and think about all that early, rather than. Uh, have uh, some poor trustee trying to figure out what was on your mind you know, later if something should happen. Um, some families, you know, I've heard it said some families never happen to ours, have conflicts. And uh, you know, that can be an issue because estate planning tends to, to dredge up some of these. And uh, it, it's, it's something that you've got to work around and hopefully resolve them while, while they're still alive. Also, people you know, think, in this case, I think quite rightly that estate planning can be complicated and it can be expensive. Yes, it can be complicated and it, uh, and it is expensive, but it's not half as expensive as not doing it. So, uh, you know, it really is better to, to, to bite the bullet and, and uh, make a commitment uh, to leave a nice, uh, clean estate uh, to your executor or trustee so that they can manage it. We have a question. Uh, yes. The question is, when's a good age to, to start estate planning? Uh, when is a good age to, estate, to start estate planning? There are differences of opinion there, but frankly, as soon as you have any estate at all that you want to, to pass on to somebody, uh, you know, that, that's the time to do it. And somebody in their 20s could work very well have a, have a reason to, to do estate planning. It doesn't have to be complicated. It could be just a simple will at that point, but if if you have you know two dollars to rub together and you have a car and you have a, a set of baseball cards that might have some value and you'd like to know who you'd like to these to get passed on to the people that are important to you, yes, you can start a you know estate planning at that point and then uh, update it every five to afterwards. Okay, so we're going to continue on. Why do we need an estate plan? I think this actually, to some extent, leads into the answer that we just, uh, for the question we just, just uh, responded to. Um, one of the issues, obviously, that people uh, recognize right up front is that you want to uh, pick who you want to uh, your assets to go to and under what circumstances. And the, the assets don't have to be large. If there are personal items in there that's important that they go to cousin Jane or Aunt Mary or somebody else, you know, this is the way to make sure that that happens. Uh, you want to provide for the management of your affairs if you're incapacitated. Um, death isn't necessarily the worst thing that can happen to you. It can be actually be a lot more complicated if you uh, get run into uh, by a truck on the freeway and, and uh, you're incapacitated to the point where you can no longer take care of, of your own affairs, uh, but you're still alive. and so. Estate planning is one way to uh, uh, to uh, pass on the information as to what you would like done and, and how you would like it done. 
Uh, if there are minor children involved, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity to appoint guardians for those and also to provide uh, for uh, any uh, uh, beneficiaries that have special needs. People with philanthropic uh, desires can, can uh, you know, the estate planning tool is a great way to, to uh, uh, nominate who, which charities you want to support them in what form and to what extent you want to support them. Uh, talking about probate, uh, a lot of folks tend to figure that probate should be avoided at all costs. That's not necessarily true, although there are some good arguments for avoiding it. There are also some reasons why you might, might not want to. So if you want to, to make that decision uh, you know, up front, you know, that's part of the, part of the reason for, for doing planning. And the, the, the reason that everybody thinks of up front, I put it at the bottom of the list, and that's to minimize taxes. Yeah, doing proper estate planning can minimize taxes and can be useful in that regard, but it's not by any means the only reason for doing it, and it's not even, in some cases, the most important reason for doing it, so I've deliberately put it at the bottom of the of the slide it, just to, uh, to, to play down the, the, uh, uh, the importance of taxes. Um, if you look at the first few items on, on, on the list here, none of those uh, have, have dollar signs attached to them, and you know, estate planning goes way, way beyond dollars and taxes. Another question. What are the reasons to go to probate? I've never heard anything good about it. <laughs> One, one of our questioners says, I've never, ever heard anything good about probate. Uh, I'm going to defer the answer to that um, to uh, later on in this session. I actually have a, have a slide that addresses just that. But uh, for the time being, let it suffice to say that there are, there are possible reasons why you might want to, to probate an estate rather than avoid it. We'll, de we'll deal with that in, an, oh, in about uh, 45 minutes or so. Be patient. Thank you. <laughs> So before you actually go calling an attorney and get uh, get all fired up on this, you want to identify ahead of time what you know, what, what what needs to be done, um, and there are no good answers to these questions. These are basically highly personal, highly subjective questions, and it is important that you sit down and think through what your answers are and be very clear on what your answers are before you get it before you go getting some of the professionals into the loop. Um, you know, the obvious one is, if you're incapacitated, who, who do you want to handle your finances? How, you know, how's that going to be taken care of? Who's going to write the checks for you every month? Who's going to manage your, your investment portfolio? Stuff like that. Um, again, you know, in, a, in a, a later slide, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of the characteristics that you should be looking for in, in picking somebody. But you, you need, at this point, to uh, decide in a nice, quiet uh, corner who you would like to uh, to do that. Um, the same thing goes for uh, for the health care. If there are any uh, life-sustaining decisions to be made, and uh, if you're unable to, to uh, make those and communicate those yourself, you know, who do you want to make those very important decisions for you? Uh, have you even uh, thought seriously about organ donation, and what, if anything, have you done about it? Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that uh, should be uh, figured out ahead of time before you go uh, uh, charging to get everything put down on paper. Uh, then we get to the normal aspects of, of uh, estate planning that people think about in a will or a trust. You know, who should inherit your assets? And, you know, how should they be divided up? You know, if you've got you know, three or four children, uh, do you want them all to, to get an equal share? or? Are the needs for one or two of them greater than the others? Are one or two of them so well off that they don't need anything? Is it important to do it equally, or will they be? Will some of them be upset if you do it unequally? Again, there are no good answers to this. There are reasons to do all of these things, you know, in, in certain circumstances. But uh, before you go to the attorney, you should probably have you know fairly clear in your mind what what you want to make happen. Same thing goes for you know for appointing guardians uh, to. Uh, care for minor children or, or, or special needs children. So the, what you need to do basically is take inventory of your life. Look at, the, look at all of the uh, current assets and liabilities, which is basically your, your financial life, your uh, uh, net worth statement. Uh, you, you probably have, or possibly have a home, maybe even a second or third home as a vacation home, other properties. Uh, what vehicles do you have? 
uh, and what jewelry or, or artwork is, do you have that's of any value, you know, as opposed to just incidental uh, you know, personal items. Um, the easiest way to cover a lot of this is to just uh, pull up the uh, most recent uh, financial statements, or it's usually actually convenient to, to take the end of year, you know, the year-end statements from your you know, checking and savings accounts and your brokerage statements, your, your IRAs and all of that stuff. If you have a safety deposit box or a home safe, you probably want to look through that and see what all is in there that's relevant uh, to uh, the whole planning process. When you start into the, into the process, you're obviously going to need an estate planning attorney, but you actually need usually a multidisciplined team. Uh, I'll cover that in a minute. We have another question first. Uh, one woman who made a uh, comment that uh, among the people or entities you should worry about is don't forget to provide for pets. Uh, particular individual talks that uh, she had it in her will. Uh, unfortunately, the pet died, but there are unusual bequests and, uh, and such that should be uh, considered. I, I absolutely you know, agree with this lady. Uh, you know, if, if you have pets, this is a good place to figure. You know, what's going to happen those if you're no longer around to take care of them? Who's going to take care of them, and who's going to fund whatever uh, the resources are needed to take care of them? So yes, she's, uh, she's absolutely correct. That that should be part of the part of the plan. Usually, you need three people. Are involved, you know, a multidisciplinary team involved. If you have a financial planner already, he or she will usually act as the quarterback and coordinate with the other team members because a good financial planner should have a, a big Rolodex in the old days, I guess, whether they be done electronically now, where they have, you know, estate planning attorneys and CPAs and so on that they work with all the time. But uh, usually the, the planner will coordinate everything and, and uh, work with you in, 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 in uh, uh, retaining an estate planning attorney who will be needed to actually write you know, the, the actual will or the trust and to make sure that all of this gets documented in a manner that, that meets all the federal and state legal requirements. It's usually useful to have a CPA or some form of enrolled agent or tax advisor on the team as well because estate planning can involve not just uh, estate taxes, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes, but also uh, income taxes, and it, it will involve the implications of what you do with your retirement, you know, your qualified retirement plans, your IRAs and rollover IRAs and Roth plans and all of that. So it's usually uh, advisable to have a, 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 a tax expert in the loop as well. Before we get into all of the details on the documents involved, I want to just take a minute to talk about the different forms of property ownership. Most folks are familiar with the, with the joint tenancy uh, concept where you've got rights of survivorship, and there are some limitations to that. It can only be used, it's very often used by a husband and wife uh, for property, and there are advantages to doing it, but there are also disadvantages. Uh, one of the limitations is that it, the the uh, item must be shared equally by all uh, by all joint tenants. It doesn't have to be two people, by the way. It's it's, mo it's very common for husband and wife to do it, but it can be three or more people. It doesn't just have to be two. Uh, but one of the the things that you should be very very clear on is that the property that's held in joint tenancy passes by operation of law to the, you know when when one joint tenant uh, uh, dies. Uh, the property passes automatically by operation of law to the survivor. It does not go through probate, and it cannot be willed. If you put it in the will, uh, you know, no good attorney should, should allow you to put it in the will in the first place, and if it does sneak in there by fair means or foul, uh, it can potentially cause a conflict if, if there's something different in there to, to you know, what happens automatically by operation of law, but, uh, but the joint tenancy will, over, will override the will and whatever you say in the will, uh, should it get in there, even you know against your your, your attorney's uh, uh, better judgment, will will be ignored. It's very often used by married couples 
but there's a problem doing it, and that is that uh, the when one when when, when the first uh, husband or, or, or wife, when the first spouse uh, dies, the assets, the, you know, the half of the, the uh, property that, was, that, that he or she held uh, will get a, a bump up in, in the cost basis uh, to the fair market value on the day of death, but the half that the surviving spouse holds does not get a bump up in cost basis. So you, you, only, you only get the, 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 the uh, cost basis increase uh, and, you know, on, on half of the property, and that can trigger some fairly hefty uh, uh, tax um, tax liabilities, tax bills later later on whenever you, whenever the property is sold. Uh, it, it's still commonly used, and it's not a disaster if, it, if, 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 if you do hold property in joint tenancy. But just be aware that you only get a, a step up in basis uh, for half the property, or for or for the the the, the, the a share of the property that you know the, that the, that the, the first person to die uh, uh, owns. Tenancy in common is a little different. The shares there can be unequal. You you can have two, three, four, any number of people, and you, one might hold ten percent, another hold forty percent, and thirty percent, whatever, whatever way you can split up, whatever way you want, and that's perfectly legal. Tenancy in, in common property can and is distributed by will or trust. It, 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 it does not pass automatically by operation of law. But again, only the interest owned by a deceased co-tenant gets to step up on basis. I want to talk quickly about community property. Before we get into community property, we're going to look at separate property. Separate property is anything acquired by a spouse before the marriage during the marriage as a gift or bequest, or after the parties have separated in a divorce? Yes, we have a question. One gentleman asks, is there any benefit of joint tenancy? Is there any benefit of joint tenancy? The biggest benefit, I guess, is that it automatically passes to the other joint tenant, but you need to just be aware that uh, uh, you know that you miss the step up in, in cost basis on half of the property. Uh, just people still use it, and uh, you know it can be a convenient way. You know, perhaps for a, a you know smaller uh, accounts, maybe uh, checking accounts or something like that. But if there's any you know holding a home or, or something, some major asset in joint tenancy can create a significant tax liability down the road. Okay, we said separate property uh, it, it is the property acquired before the marriage or during the marriage. If, if, you know, if somebody gets a, gets a gift uh, or a bequest, you know, if, if, if Aunt Mary leaves somebody you know, their, their home or $100,000 or whatever uh, to one of the spouses, uh, that can be considered separate property. And as such, if they need to take care to keep it a separate property, not commingle it, with the, with the rest of the uh, assets in, in, in the marriage, but it, it can be treated uh, as separate property. Another question. One individual asks, does this cost basis step up mean that property taxes goes up or uh, upon death of one spouse? The, the question relates to the property taxes and then the combination of how that how that's affected by the step up in, in cost basis. The, the property taxes have nothing to do with what I've been talking about. What I've been talking about is is the step up in cost basis for for the capital gains uh, for income taxes. Uh, you know, if somebody owned uh, Apple stock that, that 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 they got in 1975 or something like that, you know, they might have put a thousand dollars into it, and it could be worth a hundred thousand dollars today. And uh, you know if uh, if it's uh, if if that's passed on a, 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 as part of uh, a, a joint tenancy. Well, let's forget the joint tenancy for a minute. And if that's passed on, uh, you know, outside of the joint tenancy, and then the, the normal approach would be that it would get a, a step up in cost basis to the value on the day of death. So that which would be to the hundred thousand dollars, and there would be no capital gains because the cost basis and the fair market value today would be the same. Um, 
but if on the other hand you only get a step up in, in, in cost basis for half of it, uh, you might find that uh, that uh, when you come to sell the stock, half of it had been revalued. It was in a, a joint tenancy. Half of it had been revalued uh, to the market value today, which would be the fifty thousand dollars. But the other half would still have a cost basis of the original thousand or whatever we said. So there would be almost fifty thousand dollars of capital gains that would then be taxed. Uh, even if you sold the stock immediately. Okay, let's move on to community property. Uh, community property is anything acquired in the marriage, mainly from earnings and salary. You know, if one or both partners are out there, uh, you know, with day jobs, working and earning money, you know, in any in any shape or form, uh, that would normally be considered community property. And community property cannot be sold or given away by one spouse without the consent of the other. It's usually split equally between the two spouses unless there's an agreement otherwise. Um, you know, it, it, even if one spouse is working and the other one is, is a, a home homebody taking care of the children at home or whatever and not specifically earning a salary, uh, the, uh, the community property states, including California, will regard whatever income comes in as being shared, uh, as equally earned by the two spouses and, and shared by the two spouses. Uh, the surviving spouse gets a step up in cost basis to, to the fair market value, you know, at the date of, of death of the other spouse. Okay, we're going to move into the what I think of, I guess, is the big five, the the, the major documents, and uh, I'm going to, like I said, treat these fairly quickly here because you may have come across a lot of this before from attorneys, and they're far better qualified than I am to go into all the the nitty-gritty details on it, but you still need to understand the pros and cons of each of these. So I am going to take a few minutes to go through each of them separately. First of all, a will. A will is a legal document expressing a person's wishes and can be used for the distribution of whatever assets and property he has or she has, you know, be it real estate or, or personal property, you know, cars or bank accounts or whatever. Uh, you, know, you can... Uh, define in the will how you want those distributed. It will name somebody to take care of the logistics of how the distribution takes place. And also, it, it, it can be used to, to uh, nominate somebody, a guardian for minor children or for uh, uh, people with special needs. One big uh, limitation on a will that a lot of folks perhaps know about but don't think about a whole lot is that it is only effective on death. And that doesn't always say, okay, so what? I mean, I, I knew a will would only become effective on death. Well, that means, though, is that you cannot in any way provide for incapacity in a will. So if somebody is either mentally or physically incapable of taking care of their assets but still alive, uh, you want to appoint some power of attorney to take care of their assets, but you cannot do it through a will because the will has no... Uh, no, no weight at all until after death. There are three parties to a will. There's the testator, who's the person making the will, you know, with the, the person who has all of the assets and, and the, made all the decisions about where they go and who's going to take care of the kids and everybody. Uh, there's the executor, who's the person who the uh, uh, testator normally appoints and nominates uh, to administer the will. And that's basically the I hate to use the term dog's body that does all the slog work and the logistics of, of, of actually implementing what, what the, uh, the, the person making the will wanted done. And then there are the heirs who, who receive all of the, uh, the assets uh, that the uh, uh, executor uh, uh, distributes amongst the, the heirs. Usually the heirs don't have any, any of the work to do. It's the executor or executrix that uh, uh, gets to do all the hard work. In a will, there are various forms of bequest, and I just want to take a minute here because there are differences in how these are treated, and they can have very practical implications you know, that down the road when the uh, executor is, is, is trying to make his distributions. The simplest thing right up front is if, if there's any specific property that, the, uh, that you want to name 
that goes to a specific person. That's a very clean statement that, uh, you know, Cousin Jane gets the, the, the Honda car in your driveway and, uh, you know, your, your son Jack gets the, the uh, vacation house that, 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 that's a, a, a Tahoe. So if you have specific property that, that's named for specific people, you know, there are very few questions that come up on that. It's a nice, easy way to do it. You can do a dollar, a specific dollar amount, you know, to people. You, you can say that, the, you know, that Cousin Joe is going to get $10,000 from this. And again, that's uh, the very clean way to, to make a bequest. Uh, you can do a percentage interest, which is getting a little more complicated. You can say that you've got three children, uh, you know, uh, Adam, uh, Betty, and Charlie, and that you want Adam to get 20% and you want Betty to get 30% and Charlie gets 50%. Uh, you know, that, that, that can certainly work, but, and it can be three equal shares if you want, whatever way you want, whatever way you decide, but you're giving, giving the heirs a certain percentage of your estate. And the other thing I want to talk about here real quickly is the residuary bequest where you name all of the, uh, the uh, heirs that get you know, all of you know, the, the specific property and the dollar uh, bequests and all of that. They say, whatever's left over when all this has been doled out, I want to go to some specific person or perhaps to a charity or something like that. You know, the, the, that's a remainder bequest or a residuary bequest. I put a comment down here that wherever there's a will, there's a way to make a mistake. Be very, very careful here because the four forms of bequest that I've shown you up here are not all equal in terms of the amount of work that needs to be done by your executor. The, the first two are very clean and those can usually be doled out to the, uh, to the heirs fairly quickly at the, you know, the, after, after the death. The second two, when you stop and think about it, require calculation of what the value of the estate is. You can't give somebody 10% of the estate with, without the question coming up, well that's fine, but what is the value of this now? Getting 10% of what? And the same, the same question comes up for the uh, residuary bequest. Uh, you know, the, the, that's what's left over after everybody else gets it, but what's left over is going to depend on the value of the estate. And normal practice in any case is going to require that, that the executor, uh, we're going to be talking about this later, but the executor will probably need to retain a, a CPA or, or financial firm to put a value on the estate at the day of death. But anybody that's heir to a fractional percentage or to a, a remainder bequest is entitled to a full copy of this accounting, uh, not just uh, for the day of death, but uh, in, as we'll be talking later, there are some cases where you may want to deliberately uh, hold off on making all of these distributions until after, you know, for a number of years until after perhaps uh, the, you know, the threat of a potential tax audit or something has passed. And if that's the case, you know, the people who are getting percentage interests uh, will have a right to know what the value of the state is on a regular basis. They also have a right to sign off on any of the major transactions. If you're selling a home or something like that, uh, you probably need to get a, a written statement uh, from the heirs that have the uh, percentage interest that it's okay with them if you sell the home for such and such a price. And that can get complicated in terms of delaying close of escrow and so on. We'll, we'll talk about that again later. So what I'm suggesting here is that uh, even though the, uh, you know, the, the, the form that you, that you use to, to make the bequest doesn't seem to make too much of a difference on the surface, when you stop and think about it, if you want to make life easy for your executor, uh, think through what, what I've uh, just been going over on this slide. Anytime there's a will, there's generally probate, and probate is the, the, okay, we have a question, I guess, on wills before we move into probate. Uh, uh, a lady asks, doesn't the executor have sole right, obligation, and discretion as to selling property, etc.? The question relates to the executor having sole right. The answer to that, I think, the simple answer is no, the executor does not have sole right. Um, if they, well, let's, let's just take uh, 
uh, let's just say that, that the home is being sold just for argument's sake and it's roughly a million dollars and uh, you know you, you, you get the real realtors involved in, and, and, and just put the thing on the market and you get an offer for 900,000 for, for the house and you figure well it's probably all I'm going to get on it maybe it's okay uh, if, if the executor decides to sell it for nine hundred thousand uh, dollars, one of the heirs can well come back afterwards and say, "You just gave that darn thing away. You should have been able to get more out of it, and that cost me real dollars because I only get ten percent of the nine hundred thousand instead of ten percent of the one million. And it can get ugly, unfortunately, afterwards. So even though the executor has most of the right, as long as he or she behaves in a reasonable, rational manner and documents everything that he does and also uh, make sure that he can justify everything, uh, it's probably okay, but you can get into some fairly nasty arguments that it can be tough to defend uh, if you uh, make, you know, if you can be considered to be making any dealing under the table or uh, uh, the, taking the easy path out rather than pushing for the last dollar. Unfortunately, heirs can become you know, really nice people, but they can become really ugly when there's, when there's serious dollars on the table and uh, litigation can be involved. It, it, so the, the executor needs to be careful. There's a, a lot of responsibility with it and there is some liability that goes with it. Okay, on to probate. Um, actually, that's a, the, that last question leads into this kind of pretty nicely because, or, or maybe the next slide, because we're, we're talking about probate and some of the advantages of probate. Um, on this slide, we're just going to talk about what probate is. Uh, it's the judicial process of administering the estate, and what happens is that the judge determines, first of all, the validity of the will, because you know nothing matters if, if the judge determines that the will isn't... isn't uh, a valid one written written and witnessed properly and by by somebody of sound mind etc the judge has the power to appoint the executor and that person is usually but not always the the, the, the executor that the person that the, uh, the person writing the will had, had has nominated uh, the judge has the right to say I, I know that the decedent uh, had suggested that uh, that John Doe be the uh, be the executor for this, but in the judge's decision, in his uh, mind, maybe John Doe is not uh, properly qualified to be executor. Maybe he's a minor. Maybe he's a little senile. Maybe etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the judge will occasionally overrule what's in the will and has the right to appoint somebody else as executor. But 99 times out of 100, the the, the judge will ratify the choice of the, the testator and, and go with the executor named in the will. And the first thing the executor usually does is, is, is retain an estate attorney because he's sure as heck going to need him, um, uh, I guess on that's very, very simple estates. Um, you should recognize that an estate that's, that's being probated includes the gross value of all property that the decedent owned, and except, and there are some exceptions. We've already talked, uh, well, no, maybe not yet, about property which passes by contract. If you have life insurance or retirement accounts, uh, payable on death accounts, anything like that, there will be a named beneficiary in that contract, and that beneficiary will, will get the, the asset in question uh, regardless of what's in the will. So it passes by, by contract and not, not by the will, and therefore will not be in probate. Property held in joint tenancy we've already discussed, and again, that passes by operation of law and will not be in the will, so it's therefore not included in the probate. And any property held in a trust will not be probated. In California, and maybe different from state to state, they usually don't bother probating estates that are less than $150,000, uh, I guess because the probate cost makes it that it's not worthwhile doing it but you can be fairly sure that any estates above $150,000 that, that are in a will are likely to be, to be probated for better or worse. A couple of times, although we, let's get into the, the duties of the executor first. Um, the executor has the responsibility to file a petition with the superior court 
uh, you know, to ask for a probate case to be opened. And, you know, the, the, that's when the judge and the court get involved in it and, uh, you know, the, the, it's officially being, being probated. Uh, the executor obviously has a duty to create an inventory of all of the, uh, the assets in the estate, you know, it includes the, the uh, uh, investment uh, portfolio and all of that stuff, whatever home or homes that are in there. And sometimes, you know, for an investment portfolio, it's very easy to put a value on it, you know, by just pulling up the most re recent statement. But it may be necessary with real estate to go out and get appraisals of what, of what the, uh, the property is, is, is valued at currently. The executor needs to uh, publicize the, uh, the, the estate so that anybody, any creditors out there uh, know that, that if, if the estate owes them any money, they need to file, file uh, uh, you know, their, their uh, invoices right away. They actually have, in California, I believe they have a four-month window. The executor gets to file all the tax returns, and while all of this is going on, to manage the estate assets, you know, keep the keep the house, you know, safe and watertight, and uh, keep the landscaping up, and, and all the rest, and keep the lights on, and also for uh, the investment portfolio, make sure that's being managed properly. And then finally, when everything is all settled and ready to go. You know, the executor needs to petition the court to allow distribution of the assets to the heirs. And when the, when the court okays that, he, he actually implements the, the, uh, the distribution and then will have to then file the final tax returns. There are statutory fees involved with, with, with probate, and they can be fairly steep. Uh, it's only it's four percent of the first hundred thousand, and the the the, the rate drops down uh, from four percent down to half a percent as the value of the estate goes up. But uh, for somebody with say a one million dollar estate, the the statutory fees paid to the court will be twenty three thousand dollars. If somebody has a larger estate, say ten million dollar estate. Uh, that person is going to, is, is, you know, the probate fee is going to be $113,000. So you're obviously talking about, you know, tens of thousands of dollars here. It's a serious, uh, serious amount of change. Uh, people very often don't realize this. When they're making a will, you know, any attorney will write up a standard will for you for a few hundred bucks, and you think you're saving money. But if, if there's a sizable estate that needs to be probated, uh, you know, the, the probate costs are going to far exceed what it might have cost initially to, to have used a trust instead of a will. Trusts typically run a few thousand dollars, maybe even as high as 10, 15,000. But that can be swamped in some cases, at least by the statutory fees of probate, uh, if you choose not to do the trust. <clears throat> People have been asking two or three times so far, and, and, you know, the, what are the possible advantages of probate? Well, one advantage is that since the court is, is supervising the distribution of assets, it's all done openly and very transparently, and it's, it's done by the court so the executor doesn't take the hit for everything that's in there. Uh, the, since it's being probated, the creditors must submit their claims within four months, so it puts a finite window on, on, on uh, getting all of the creditors to submit their 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 bills and get them paid off, and it, it, it avoids the potential for somebody coming in a year later and saying, you're, you're, I did some work for your father you know, last year and he owes me $23,000 for that and it's not being paid. Uh, you know, you, the probate puts a very finite end to the uh, allowable window. The other thing that the probate does that's positive is it transfers clear title to all of the property. Uh, it avoids any issues where there might be a cloud on the title and uh, any, any dubious uh, title uh, contest that, that might be involved. So one, once it passes through probate, uh, anybody inheriting property will get clear, clean title to the property. The final thing that I have on here is an advantage is that the court is available to settle all the disputes amongst the heirs. You know, if there's any infighting in the family that goes on, or even if the heirs and the executor can't agree on, 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 on 
uh, some of the issues, the court is available to step in and will step in and, and mandate how that gets settled. Everybody I think is already familiar with the disadvantages of probate. It's highly complex. There's you know, petitions, accountings, hearings that go on ad nauseum. Uh, there's a total lack of privacy. Anybody can go to City Hall or wherever the records are, are, are kept and request to, to see a copy of the probate you know, on, any, on any estate. Uh, so there's no privacy whatsoever. It's time consuming and I've put down a few months here as the shortest period. I think even a simple estate is going to usually take at least a few months to probate. But it can go on for a few years. It can go, can go on for a decade or more. And as we've just seen, the cost can be fairly high. It, it can be a lot higher than the uh, cost of administering a trust. Question. You stated for uh, pros and cons that the creditors must submit claims within four months. Does that mean other forms, for example, trusts, uh, there is no legal limit for how long creditors can make claims against the estate? I believe the answer to that is probably yes. I'm not sorry. Again, you probably need to talk to an attorney, but with a will that's being probated, there's a very clear limit. With the trust, that limit, to the best of my knowledge, is not in there, and I'm not sure when any statute of limitations would be regarded as, as, as running out on any claims. But it's not, it's not going to be spelled out by probate, so it will be a little fuzzier, and uh, I don't think there is a definite uh, end to it. Another question. Uh, this is more in the way of a comment. Uh, one gentleman uh, suggests that uh, they've seen situations where the, the cost for setting up a trust is somewhere between two and four thousand yeah, dollars. The, the cost for setting up a trust, uh, the suggestion was between two and four thousand dollars. My experience would say that's possible. That's probably on the low end. Some com some more complicated trusts can run two, three, or four times that. Uh, a lot depends on how complicated the trust is and what all you're trying to accomplish. But recognize that a trust is a much more flexible document than a will, and there's the opportunity, the potential, to put paragraphs or even pages in there defining how you want some, some issues handled. And if you avail of that flexibility, it can probably run the cost of the trust up to you know, 10,000 bucks would not be you know, totally unreasonable. Even if you've not written a will and don't think you have one, the state has news for you. If you die in testate, which is the term for without a, without a will, uh, the state has written one for you and it may or may not follow what you wanted in terms of, of who gets what chunks of your property and who, who gets appointed to take care of your minor children and so on. Uh, the other issue with the, the will that the state puts together is that there's absolutely no provision in there for passing on anything to any friends or charities. It's totally to folks that are related by, by blood or by marriage, and outside of that, uh, there will be no provision in the, in the state will. And again, the, the, the probate court will, will appoint a, you know, an administrator, they call it, rather than a, an executor, uh, you know, if, if, it's the, if it's the state will. So I guess the message here, the simple takeaway here is it's better to write one yourself and get what you want done and explain what you want uh, rather than uh, have the state do it for you. California in test, in, in test law, uh, I'm just giving you what happens here. I'm going to go through it very, very quick because it's not worth spending a whole lot of time on. But uh, you can see that for somebody who's not married or somebody who was previously married and is possibly a widow or something like that, you know, the children come first, then the, then the parents, then the, the siblings, then the more distant cousins, but they're all related. There's nothing on here for, for friends or for charity. If the decedent was, was married, community property goes to the surviving spouse and then any separate property gets divided up by the state and between the spouse and the children and that can be a little complicated way beyond what we want to get into here. 
So, the, are there any, any final questions on on wills before we move into the trust? Okay, we're going to move ahead then with the with the revocable living trust. Uh, the written, uh, it's a written agreement to distribute the assets in the estate and to take care of minor children and a whole bunch more. It's, it can be a lot more flexible than a will and also since the trust can be effective prior to death, it can be used to accommodate incapacity and it, that's very often or normally part of, part of a trust. A trust, because of its flexibility, can be particularly useful where there are young children uh, that, that, that need to have guardians appointed. You can write pages on who you want to take care of the problem and why. And it's also very useful in, in terms of uh, leaving property to children from a previous marriage or dealing with, you know, with, with, with prior families and how that relates to the current family. Three parties again to a trust. There's the grantor or settler who's the person funding the trust. Uh, there's the trustee who's, who's the equivalent of the executor for a will. That's the person appointed to, to manage the actual uh, distribution, the, the one who works through all the logistics. And then there's the beneficiaries to the trust who are the equivalent of the heirs to the will. We're going to get into a minute for federal estate tax. I just want you to see how, how that has changed over the years. If you go way back to the early 2000s, it was less than, it was just, you know, it was, sat at $675,000 for a long time and uh, then in the early 2000s bumped up to 1 million to, and then to 2 million. Um, 2010, bingo, what a great year, it was repealed totally and uh, obviously there's no maximum rate that applies, there just was no uh, uh, estate tax. But what doesn't show here is that when the estate tax was repealed it wasn't just glory days for anybody who died in 2010 because it also repealed the step up in basis uh, that folks would normally have gotten otherwise so that anybody who, who had an estate to be uh, uh, administered from uh, 2010 got the dubious joy of going back and looking at the cost basis of when the home was bought in 1943 and what the Apple stock cost basis was in 78 and so on and paying the, uh, uh, the the capital gains tax on, on, on that smaller uh, uh, cost basis. In 2011, uh, the Congress finally, I think, got its act together and fixed on a, on a $5 million exclusion. And they said at that time that it's going to get a cost of living uh, you know, uh, increase each year. So uh, it's gone up from $5 million even in 2011 to 5.45 in 2016, and I believe in 2017 it's, it's snuck up a little bit more to 5.49. What that means is that a married couple that basically gets to each use that amount has almost $11 million uh, of uh, uh, federal estate tax exclusion. And the, the rate has been fixed at 40%, the maximum rate at 40% for the last few years which means you only only pay that on the amount above the 11,000, well, for the first to die above the $5.49 million. And the, the classic form of the revocable living trust is usually known just as an AB trust. And if you start at the bottom of this slide, uh, you, you'll note where the, uh, the uh, S1 and S2 are defined as being the first and second spouse to die, just to keep the, 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 the language a little simpler. Uh, trust B is usually known as the bypass trust or the exclusion trust, and that will be typically the maximum uh, exclusion amount for the first to die. And the purpose of this is, is that that passes on to somebody other than the surviving spouse, and it, uh, the, the goal is to get that amount as possible out of the estate and the next generation uh, without uh, uh, have it covered by uh, the using the exclusion uh, the first time around. Typically, uh, the uh, the surviving spouse gets the use uh, of the uh, income and, and, and access to the principal uh, for the, the uh, trust B uh, for the principal can be used for, for the HEMS, health, education, maintenance, and support. Uh, but the, since the trustee basically gets to decide you know, what is health education maintenance and supporting of a fairly broad definition there. 
trust A is the survivor's trust. And obviously, trust the you know the survivor still hangs on to all of his or her own her own property, and then would receive typically the uh, balance of, of of the first to die of S one's property above the exclusion amount, and there is no there would be no uh, taxes on that because there's the uh, unlimited uh, marital deduction uh, you know, for any any uh, assets that are passed from the from S one's uh, uh, property to the uh, to the surviving spouse, and obviously the, the surviving spouse has has full access and control uh, to everything in, in in trust A. Easiest way to remember this is trust A, the survivor's trust, is the above the ground trust. Trust B is the bypass trust, is the below the ground trust for the uh, for the first to die. Practical aspects of the trust. Um, whenever you sign all of the trust documents, you need to make sure that you uh, transfer all of your major assets into the trust. Uh, the you know, the attorney will help you with this, but all you know um, major investment accounts that you have with Schwab or uh, uh, TD Ameritrade, any any of these folks at Fidelity, you, know, you need to write them all letters and and, and say that you're that the assets that in the account are being moved into the trust and they will change the name on the trust you know to the XYZ revocable living trust uh, with so and so and so and so as trustees dated such and such a date you know it's two or three lines of, 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 of address that will come in on all of your uh, your statements every month uh, but uh, it is important to take the time and trouble to transfer the assets into the trust um, Usually the attorney will help you, or in some most cases, actually do the transfer for your for your home and uh, for the real estate into the trust. Because again, that has to be titled as trust property and and not uh, joint tenancy or whatever. If you want to do a refi, a trust may complicate it. It certainly used to do in the old days, and it may still do it, where a lot of mortgage companies don't like to finance property held in a trust because it complicates their life, they may require you to take it out of the trust temporarily to do the refinance, and then as soon as you get the refinance done, you put it back into the trust, and it's kind of a left hand to right hand, back to the left hand thing, and uh, I don't think anybody's fooling anybody on it, but I'm not sure that's even necessary anymore, but it, it used to be a little complication. Anything that you don't put into the trust will be covered by a pour over will. You know, the, 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 the trust will usually have a, um, a, a, a simple will attached to it which says that everything that you haven't included in the trust automatically get, gets rolled into the trust by the pour over will. We have a question. Uh, this is more of an item of a comment. Uh, a particular person is saying that uh, with regards to the uh, refi that they did it a few years ago, uh, they had no issues. Uh, they were dealing with a condo and such, and and uh, and that uh, piece of uh, property was in the trust. So uh, just so we 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 have evidence that there's at least one mortgage company out there, some you know, a few years ago, that was perfectly willing to uh, to uh, finance property held in that trust. They, they may all do it at this point. I'm really not sure. I haven't done a refi for some time, and. Uh, you know, the, the mortgage companies may well have uh, accepted the inevitable that a lot of properties will be held in trust and that they may as well uh, you know, do the same thing easily. Uh, once the trust is drawn up and all of the properties, uh, the, you know, the major properties are, are, are retitled in the name of the trust, the trustee, will, the, the trustor will usually act as his or her own, her own trustee as long as, as long as he or she is alive then after the, the, the death, uh, then the, the successor trustee uh, will, will, uh, will take over. Uh, I'm going to cover a couple of different power of attorney documents. First one relates to the uh, durable power of attorney for financial matters, you know, covers legal issues as well. And that's, a, that, that's to cover the case where somebody may be incapacitated and no longer capable of uh, of managing their own affairs, and you know somebody has to pay the bills and to 
access the online accounts, uh, manage the investments, all of this good stuff. So, so the uh, durable power of attorney is, is the way to pick a person to do this and to give them the authority to do it for you. The authority can come in two forms. It can either be immediate or springing. The immediate, as the name suggests, is that as soon as the document is signed, the, the agent that you name as durable power of attorney, often known as the attorney in fact, can immediately start uh, uh, managing the property on your behalf. For a springing uh, uh, authority, it usually takes two doctors uh, to effectively uh, determine incapacity and to agree on that uh, to uh, uh, start to the uh, uh, power of attorney into effect. And one big issue here that's not immediately obvious and, uh, is that durable power of attorney terminates on death. It's got no uh, value whatsoever the day after death. Question. You know, this question has to do uh, with the previous subject of trust. Uh, individual uh, states that, well, I believe I was told that the tax deferred savings should not go into a trust. Could you explain how those might be handled? The question relates to, I guess, qualified retirement because tax deferred savings, IRA, traditional IRAs and stuff like that. If you go, I'm not going to flip back on the slides now, but if you go back 10 or 12 slides, I showed one slide uh, that uh, included mention of stuff that's not covered in probate and it shouldn't go into a trust either, and that includes the... Uh, uh, the retirement accounts. Retirement accounts, you should have a named beneficiary in the document. You should have a document that, say, that says, you know, I name my son Jack or whatever as primary beneficiary, uh, or you can name two or three and they each get whatever percentage you want. And you can also name successor beneficiaries if you want. And Fidelity or Vanguard or TRO Price, whoever you're using, will have documents to do this and you should not only be very, very careful to fill those out, but to check it on a regular basis, certainly if anything changes, but probably every two or three years anyway, because if you do not name a beneficiary on there, uh, if there is no named beneficiary, then the property could get accidentally rolled into a trust, and that's not necessarily what you want. So the the, the questioner is absolutely right in that regard, that the uh, the... Uh, there are some documents uh, or some uh, accounts, the, the uh, deferred, uh, uh, tax deferred accounts will not be part of the trust. Okay, moving on. Uh, we've covered durable power of attorney. Uh, how do you pick the agent for your uh, power of attorney? Uh, typically, it will be a relative or a trusted friend. Uh, it can be a bank or some other financial institution. Uh, the important characteristics obviously are that it's somebody who's trustworthy. You've got to have some honest person in there because you don't want somebody managing your, your affairs that you don't trust. It should be somebody competent and knowledgeable, and it should be somebody who understands where you're coming from, understands your philosophy, and under, somebody who understands, for example, your concept of what investing is all about. Now, suppose, for example, you are perfectly happy with a passive investing strategy where you build up a portfolio of uh, uh, you know, a diverse portfolio of, of, of uncorrelated assets you know, of using passive index funds but your 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 agent your power of attorney uh, or your uh, agent happens to be a day trader he, he or she has to remember there will be no day trading in this account that he has to do it per uh, your philosophy and, and your instructions. Uh, you can name co-trustees if you want to, um, uh, co-agents. You have to be careful because if they are in agreement, there's no problem. But if you have differences in, in philosophy here and differences of opinion, you do not want to have co-trustees arguing over, over what the right thing is. So be a little careful when you're picking those. And we're going to look at the same equivalent document now for health care, the durable power of attorney for health care. Again, it authorizes an agent uh, to, to speak on your behalf, uh, to negotiate or consult with the doctor on 
and what your medical status is, what the prognosis is, what's the best treatment for you, and so on. Uh, and you should probably name at least one alternate agent in case the first one either is unable to act or declines to act, doesn't want the responsibility. Uh, again, typically the agent will, will be given the authority to act on your behalf if two doctors can affirm that you are no longer capable of making any of these decisions for yourself. As long as you're capable of, make, of deciding for yourself what's best, you know, that's what rules regardless of, of what your, uh, your, your health care agent thinks. And again, the uh, power of attorney expires on death. A living will lets you state how much care you want and what you don't want. Um, you know, if you're incapacitated, uh, you know, some folks, it gives you the chance to say ahead, uh, ahead of time, you know, how many extraordinary uh, uh, resuscitations or, 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 or care do you really want? And, you know, what sort of artificial respiration, if any, do you want? Or do you just want you know, to, to put a, a do not resuscitate uh, uh, sign on your chart and, and, and not go through all the heroic measures? It allows you to, to decide and, and, and state up front whether you want to be involved with force feeding or what your your, note, your your feelings are on pain relief, donation of organs. No, all of this can, can be part of, of your living will. It's a way of expressing ahead of time uh, what, uh, what your wishes are so that your agent can, uh, can, can make that known. A question coming up. Uh, one person has a question on, uh, he has a three daughters, so planning to uh, update their trust, and since they are uh, become uh, minus to majors, at this point he was thinking of uh, adding them as a co-trustees. Uh, with the majority being make a decision among the three, is there a problem? <laughs> <laughs> Question relates to three daughters, and would, would it make sense to name all three as co-trustees and how do they make a decision if there's if, if they're not in agreement? Um, I guess if there's you not first of all, it's perfectly legal to do that. There's no reason why you can't do it legally. Um, the issue really comes up that as long as they're getting unanimous decisions, everything's nice and simple. If there's a difference of opinion, do you want to go with a majority vote, or uh, does it take a, a, a unanimous decision to to, to do any action? Um, a trust will give you the flexibility to put all of that in there, but you might just be better off to pick the one daughter that you think best represents your thinking and is most likely to honor your thinking and follow it. Uh, but if you want to put the three of them in there, that's perfectly okay. It can be done, but just recognize there may be some conflicts. Okay, on the, on the living will, uh, what typically happens in California, at least, is that the power of attorney for health care and the living will are both rolled into, in, into one document called an advanced health care directive. So that's, uh, you know, that kind of simplifies it a little bit uh, to some extent. Who should you appoint for your health care agent? Again, it's, it's kind of somewhat parallel to your uh, attorney, in fact, for, uh, uh, for financial affairs. Your family and friends come to mind first. They need to be competent and knowledgeable. The one slight difference, I guess, for the healthcare is that you need somebody who's assertive but not overly controlling. You need somebody who's got not afraid to speak their own mind or really, in, in this case, to speak your mind assertively when they're uh, consulting with the doctors. You know, to listen, to consult with the doctors, listen to their viewpoint, but have the uh, enough assertion to resist it if they truly think that this is not in your best interest or not what you would want. Uh, but they don't want to be overly controlling or they're nitpicking every little thing and making life totally unbearable uh, for themselves and for the doctors and the, the, the medical staff and, and, and the other siblings. So you need to pick the, 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 the agent fairly carefully. You also probably need to sign a HIPAA release, which is what's needed to enable the doctor to, to discuss your medical condition and, and, and the case with somebody other than yourself. Um, you should discuss 
the contents of your of, of this document with the with your agents or the proxies at the time you write it up, so they so they know clearly what you want. It gives you the chance to explain to them what you're asking for and why. And you should obviously give them copies of the document so that they have it and they can review it and uh, provide it to the doctor. You should probably also give a copy to the to your primary doctor. I put a quick slide in here for charitable giving, but for those folks who are interested in it, there are a number of ways of doing it, some very simple and some not. The, the simplest is obviously to put a simple bequest in either a will or in a trust which says that you want to leave such and such a charity so many dollars, and you know that can be done in, in either the will or in the trust. There are donor advised funds out there where you can make a donation to the fund and it will be tax deductible immediately on the donation but the fund will be managed by a trustee uh, for the benefit of charities in general, and you don't have to decide on until later, till a later date, specifically which charities you want your share of that uh, to be distributed to. Um, it's a way of basically taking a tax deduction for a charitable contribution immediately, even though you're not quite sure yet uh, who you want it to go to, and you still have some issues to work out with. There are a couple of forms, well, there are more, there are probably dozens of different forms of, of charitable trust, but I've just flagged the, the two major ones here. There's a charitable remainder trust, and there's a charitable lead trust. With the remainder trust, you know, the donor gets the income from the, from the assets during his lifetime, but when, when he passes on, you know, the, the principal from the assets go to the charity. And again, you get a tax deduction for what's perceived as the uh, fair market value of the, it won't be for the full amount, but it'll be for the present value of, of the future gift as it were. For a charitable lead trust, it works the other way around. The charity receives the income from the, from the uh, assets, and at death, the assets, the principal amount, reverts back to the, to the donor's estate. Now, the other thing, and I'm not going to get into it anymore and just mention it here, is that you can go to an attorney and set up a private foundation and do whatever you want in it, and there's all sorts of uh, potential uh, tax reasons for doing it, but it could be expensive, and uh, it's probably mostly for the high net worth individuals. The letter of intent, I'm going to cover very quickly here too, because it's a useful document, but it is not a legal document, and some attorneys actually frown on it because it's got the potential to say something different than the letter of intent to what's covered in the will or the trust. Uh, it's mainly used as a way of giving your your trustee or your executor a cheat sheet on you know what a lot of the information that he or she is going to need uh, to have a, a, a access to and at their fingertips so that, you know, at the time that they're starting to manage uh, your your affairs for you. And it, it needs to include how they're going to access all of your electronic data, you know, your email and your, your uh, electronic access to your, your uh, Schwab accounts and stuff like that. But you can also spell out a bunch of, of, of personal stuff and what type of funeral you'd like. Uh, you can even name what music you'd want out of and all that good stuff. Uh, if you've made any prearrangements, this would be a good place to, to spell them out so that your trustee knows what, 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 what arrangements have been made. Uh, you can even write your own obituary if, if you want to include it in there. And it should probably also include a, a list of you know, people to contact, not just friends and relatives that have stayed here, but also maybe your, your, the professional folks in your life, your financial planner, the contact information for, for him and for the estate planning attorney and stuff like that. It's all stuff to just make life a little easier uh, for, for, the, uh, for the trustee. Now, some folks also write what they call an ethical will, which I've not covered here, but it's kind of the equivalent thing, but it explains your, uh, the ethical aspects of your, your, your philosophy for life, what's important to you, and what, the kind of stuff that you'd want to pass on to your kids and be remembered by. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of slides here to cover California's End of Life Option Act. Uh, loosely known as the right to die law. Uh, Jerry Brown signed that in uh, on October in 2015, but didn't actually go into effect 
uh, until June of uh, 2016. Since it was passed in a special session on health care, there were some folks who didn't want to see it passed who filed a challenge arguing that it wasn't passed in general session and therefore was not fully legal and they tried to have to file an injunction to have it to halt the implementation of it the judge has denied the 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 injunction however there's the potential that it may still be appealed in the future the, you know the, you probably need to check on it to, you know if it becomes an issue even if the injunction is is never implemented um, there's a sunset clause that's all, that on, unless there's any further action taken by January of, of 2026 it will automatically uh, fade away. Looking at the practical considerations of the right to die law, the, 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 you, you need to be a California resident, need to be over 18 and all the stuff that you'd expect, you need to have mental capacity to make your own decisions. Uh, you have to have two physicians um, diagnosed being with a terminal illness with uh, less than six months to live, which is the same kind of thing that that, that covers hospice patients. Now you have to make a voluntary request. Actually, you have to make at least three voluntary requests to the attending physician. Two oral requests that have to be at least 15 days apart plus a written request, and it, these cannot be made through your power of attorney or healthcare as part of the healthcare directive. And you have to be physically capable of self-administering the drug. When you look at these limitations, it automatically excludes people uh, you know, with Alzheimer's disease because they no longer have the mental capacity to make their own decisions. And it also excludes comatose patients because they no longer have the physical capacity to self-administer the drug. So even though the law has great intent and in, uh, you know is following I guess um, the model of the Oregon law and there are a number of other states out there that are doing this. There are practical limitations that uh, may not be obvious uh, you know initially to somebody that that's aware of the law. Okay, we're going to get back to the the practical duties of I've said of a trustee here, but it's also for an executor. Um, the first issue that comes up is uh, are what I call the pre-need considerations. What, what should you do ahead of time if you've been named as an executor or, an executor or a trustee uh, long before the death? You need to read and understand all the documents and you've got a very fundamental decision to make and that is do you want the job or not? Uh, it's obviously a great honor to be appointed as, as a trustee. Uh, the, the, the trustor has obviously got a lot of confidence in, in, in your uh, your abilities and your integrity, but you need to recognize that there's a, a ton of hard work involved and it's very time consuming. It's a huge responsibility and there can be legal liabilities if you don't follow all of the uh, uh, requirements that, that, are, that, are, that are called out. It may or may not be compensated. Usually with a trust, uh, the attorney uh, that's uh, administering it will, will typically charge 1% of the gross estate. So it means if somebody has a gross estate, you know, at a home at maybe a million dollars and another million dollar uh, for uh, investment accounts, something if you got a two million dollar estate, a gross estate, uh, then the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the attorney would, would typically uh, file for a, a $20,000 fee. Very often, the attorneys suggest that the uh, that the trustee uh, take a similar fee, you know, the, the, the comparable one percent. Recognize when I say here that uh, when we're talking about probate estate, and that what uh, uh, pertains here as well, we're talking about the gross estate, which ignores any mortgages. If you have a million dollar home and a nine hundred thousand dollar mortgage on it, you know your 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 equity in the home is is a hundred thousand dollars. And then if you have, say, a million dollar uh, investment account as well, your net worth might be $1.1 million. However, the gross estate is $2 million, and that's what you're going to pay the probate fees on, and that's the number that the attorney uh, will calculate his fee on and suggest that the trustee do likewise. Question. 
Dealing with the issue of legal liability for the trustee, is there uh, insurance that, some form of insurance that can be bought to, to cover the liability aspect? And should that be part of, can that be included as an expense for the trust? Question comes up about insurance, liability insurance for the trustee. I don't know of this, but it's certainly not an unreasonable thing to look into if you are appointed trustee. And I imagine that uh, it probably can be counted as an expense of the trust. I think the trustor may well, uh, and the attorney writing the trust may well put a paragraph in there that, that says in essence that as long as the trustee is acting in good faith and honorably, uh, then he or she will not be held liable. But um, if there is if there is not such a clause in there, um, you can probably insure most anything that moves, and this would uh, this could well be covered. Uh, so it would be worth doing a little research, but I don't know the answer. Somebody wants, does not want a job, if they figure this is just way beyond my capability or I just don't have time for it, they can decline to accept it, but if uh, but the time to do it would be would be while the trustor is still alive and managing the trust himself or herself. Uh, if you wait until after the death, you have to wait until a new trustee has been installed, which could take weeks or months. You can't just say, "I quit. I'm out of here," and leave the trust unmanaged. You have to wait until the new trustee is installed first. Obviously, the immediate task for the trustee will normally relate to, to uh, working with the mortuary, uh, you know, verifying all of the details that go into the death certificate. Uh, you should, they say you should typically order 20 copies. I've found personally that you don't need 20, that four or five is probably adequate, but since they're fairly cheap and the mortuary orders them for you anyway, I would still suggest ordering 20, and if 15 of them go on use, it's no big deal. Uh, but it's a lot better than running out and needing needing one or two more than you actually have and trying to get them in a hurry yourself later. Uh, you obviously have the responsibility of signing off on all of the documentation for burial and cremation, scattering of the, of the ashes and so on, and reviewing a lot, of, a lot of those documents, especially for the scattering of the ashes and distributing whatever uh, you get if there, if there were a service of some sort you know, for the scattering or whatever you may want to distribute and uh, whatever you can from that to the, to the family members that were not uh, able to, to attend. It's usually in the trustee's best interest to keep on really good terms with the family and uh, with, uh, with the heirs and the beneficiaries. Um, as particular, I'll say, I shouldn't say particular, too, but it certainly includes those that are remote. You know, there may well be a number of, of, of beneficiaries on the East Coast and only the folks on the West Coast may, may be actively involved, but um, it's usually worthwhile uh, keeping them all well informed of what's happening and why. Um, you also probably have the responsibility immediately of notifying Social Security office so that they, Social Security and Medicare stops, you know, their checks and Medicare uh, coverage will obviously stop. I think that these folks have some way of finding out, even if you don't notify them. I'm not sure quite how it happens, but they will they will know or have a need to know very, very quickly after the death. And also, the bank accounts and brokerage accounts will all get frozen for 40 days, and that happens pretty much immediately. And again, I think they are tapping into the Social Security database, and uh, if you don't notify them, I think they figure it out very quickly themselves. If the deceased uh, you know, died in a nursing home, then you obviously that account to settle out and close out. And all of this will happen um, and within the first few days. Uh, it can be a very busy time. Uh, legal issues for the trustee. Uh, you need to retain a, an estate attorney right up front. You don't want to, this is not a do-it-yourself project. Usually, the draft, the, the attorney that, that drafted the trust is uh, is an obvious first choice because he's already familiar with it. However, if he's no longer around, or if you're used to working with a different attorney or in a different state or whatever, uh, there's nothing wrong with with, with uh, hiring a totally different attorney. He'll just he'll have to take the the trust and go through it and, and become familiar with it. But 
uh, that's certainly legal and in some cases practical. But in most cases, uh, the, the drafting attorney is, is, is the obvious first choice. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of time with him initially collecting a whole ton of, of data that, that he's going to need and supporting him in, in whatever ways uh, that he needs. Uh, typically, the state attorney will file for a new tax ID for the trust. You no longer use the, 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 the deceased's uh, Social Security number, so you need to have a, a, a new tax ID. Very often, the estate attorney will file for that, but if he doesn't, you're going to need to do it yourself. It's just a fairly simple document, but it does need to get done fairly quickly. Um, a previous question was asking about the uh, trustee insurance. One way to make sure you do not generally need that is when you're signing documents, make sure that it's very clear that you're signing in the name of the trust by putting the word trustee after your name when you sign. This is for signing checks or signing any agreements or contracts or whatever. Um, if you neglect to put the word trustee in there, you can be held personally liable for whatever uh, uh, debts or whatever are incurred. And uh, it's you want you want to make sure that, that that you're acting in the name of the trust. What a lot of folks don't figure initially, but becomes obvious when you get into it, is that if the deceased is the second to die. The first to die will very often have left the uh, the trust B that we talked about earlier, and that has, you know, on, on the on the death of the first to die uh, spouse, that trust B becomes a an irrevocable trust, and that may have been a few years ago or even decades ago, but what, but the the second to die spouse will have been managing that as trustee over that intervening time. And then when the second spouse to die passes, uh, at that point, you know, you, there, you've suddenly got this, this older irrevocable trust is hanging out there. And it's important to determine who the trustee on that is. And it may be somebody that nobody's ever heard of because it could have been written 30 years ago. Uh, but there may be some advantage to contacting that trustee and requesting that they vacate the, the position so that the trustee for the second trust uh, can can uh, distribute the assets for both trusts. Uh, it's not necessary to do that, but it, it can actually make the logistics a little easier to handle both of them in parallel. But you need the consent of not just the other initial trustee, but also the beneficiaries of the original trust need to basically sign off that, it, that, that they're okay with you becoming the the successor trustee for that earlier trust as well. Financial issues, if again, if it's the second to die spouse, there's usually a home involved and there are file cabinets and drawers all stuffed with statements that are from last year and last decade. You know, there's going to be all sorts of financial stuff lying around and one of your first tasks is to go through all of that, collect it all up, and safeguard it, bring it. And what I typically find most useful is, it, it, is to put it all in a whole bunch of the old Xerox boxes and, and cart them all home and sort through them at home. You can do it on site if you want to, depending on where the home is and you know how, how convenient it is. But especially if the home is going to be sold eventually or even sooner rather than later, it's usually more practical. You know, to, to bring a couple of dozen Xerox boxes home and while you're watching TV, you can sift through them. And there's a fairly large amount of material, a lot of work involved, but all of the unwanted documents you need, to, you need to, to strap. And a lot of them will have to be shredded because a lot of these documents you know, will have uh, uh, statements with, with person's name and social security number and, and and account numbers and all that on it. So you have to be careful not to just toss it all in the recycle bin. A lot of it needs to be shredded. And whatever documents that are in there uh, that are needed, uh, you hopefully you'll get it down to two, three, or four boxes of material rather than you know, 10 or 20 of them. Uh, you need to make uh, arrangements to store them either in your home or off-site somewhere for typically three to seven years. It's actually longer than that because the trust itself may be it may not be totally closed out for about three years. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
So you could be you could be looking at storing documents for ten years or longer. As as soon as the banks uh, the brokerage accounts find out about the death, all of these accounts will be frozen by state law for forty days. So you can't write any checks. You can't get in and manage the uh, investment portfolio. You know the the bank or the uh, uh, the uh, brokerage account is just not going to recognize any orders that you give them or any checks that you, you know typically where you find out about this if you happen to have been the the attorney in fact or they have the durable power of attorney for the person when they are alive you've been signing checks for their in their name and suddenly they're they've passed on and you can no longer sign checks on their account anymore because the account has been frozen so even though you'll be signing them after 40 days as the trustee, as opposed to the uh, the the attorney, in fact, the uh, agent, um, there's a there's a gap in the middle where you where they're frozen and nobody has any authority to get in there. Um, after the 40 days is over, hopefully by that time you will have the new tax ID and you can reopen all of the accounts as as the trust accounts now with the new tax ID and as trustee you can now get in there and manage them again. Question. Uh, several questions here. Oh, well, <laughs> if you have mutual fund accounts, do they get transferred to the name of your estate beneficiaries, or do they get closed? Why is there the comment to manage the accounts? Do they remain open? Okay, if you have mutual fund accounts. They will stay in the, initially in the name of the trust, and the trust, as we're going to see in a minute, may remain active, not closed out for as long as three years. The reason for doing that is, is to at least let the, um, of the potential of an IRS audit pass, so you don't want to totally distribute the funds for, for a number of years. Um, and during that time, the funds that are left in the trust will be named in the trust. And the reason I'm saying that they need to be managed is that you know even if somebody has set up a a passive portfolio, it should probably be rebalanced once a year or something like that. It needs to be monitored and and uh, and managed on a usually on what they call the prudent person rule, uh, which means that you don't go making any sudden moves and as you. You, you manage it carefully and conservatively. The other reason you want to manage it carefully and conservatively is that it's, it's now a short-term trust because you're going to be distributing the assets from that probably within three years and you don't want to go putting it into putting a whole lot of major stock equity positions in there that could could totally tank over, over the three-year period. Normal, normally for anything, you know, most portfolio managers will say that that anything less than five years, you should have very minimal exposure uh, to equities. So that's one reason why, they, again, that should be managed conservatively. After the trust is totally distributed, then it will get get re you will typically liquidate it and distribute the checks to the beneficiaries, and they can do whatever they want as the account that deal with with that uh, what accounts they open. Um, it's not. I don't think it's possible, it certainly isn't normal, to uh, distribute uh, equities in kind you know, to, the, to the beneficiaries without liquidating. It's far easier to, to liquidate it, and that's the normal way of doing it. Another question. Could you ex please expand uh, file affidavit to open new accounts? Is this to pay bills and receive proceeds? The answer is yes, all of the above. The accounts that were frozen for 40 days by the estate never become unfrozen in their original form. The, the, what happens at the end of 40 days is that the old accounts are actually closed out and the new accounts are opened up with the new tax ID and the old social security number no longer means anything. So. The attorneys will probably have to file an affidavit uh, saying that this person died on such and such a date, and uh, you know, the 40 days is now over, and can you please open the, you know, a trust account with this uh, tax ID? And you just move the assets, get moved straight over into it without being liquidated. You know, the Schwab will 
will just retitle the account, but it will get retitled in the name of the trust as opposed to the individual person. Uh, utilities is fairly obvious. You, know, you want to file a change of address you know, right away. What's typically the easiest thing to do is, is, is to file a change of address with the post office and all the utilities to have mail forwarded to your own home. You don't have to do that. You can still let the mail come to the you know, to the deceased's home if, you know, if it's fairly convenient. But you, you really don't want to be have to the chore of going around there every every couple of days and picking up mail and and seeing what bills are due and, and taking care of everything there. So it's usually most practical to just go to the post office and file a change of address there and get and file a change of address with all the utilities and everything sent to your home or, or post office box or somewhere more convenient. Um, you want to make sure that the gas, electricity, water, you know, trash collection, all of this, you know, that the bills still get paid and that the service still remains on because until the house is sold, you need to make sure that it's kept in good working order and that you still have power and, and light and so on. Um, on the other hand, you probably don't need a telephone there anymore. You almost certainly don't need cable TV service and stuff like that. So you want to, to uh, close out those accounts and, and get, get simplify your life and get them off the hook. Question. One gentleman asks, do the heirs, in, heirs inherit the IRAs without going through probate? Yes. Uh, the, the, there's no such thing as an heir to an IRA account. The IRA account, when it's open, you should sign a beneficiary statement. So when, when you die, the, the account goes to the beneficiary. And it does not pass by by will to an heir, and does not go through probate, and should not be included in the trust. It goes automatically to the beneficiary that's named on the on the document, and make sure your beneficiary statements are up to date, and that you don't forget about it. That's particularly true in the case of a divorce. There have been many many situations where folks have had an IRA account and put their spouse on as beneficiary. They get divorced, and 10 years later, nobody's ever thought to go back and change the beneficiary, and the ex-spouse will get the, uh, uh, get the IRA, you know, even though that was the last thing that the person intended at that time, you know, the later date. Selling a home, most folks know all about what's involved with that without me going through all the details, but it does get a little bit more complicated uh, you know, if, you, if you need to sell a home for uh, for the, uh, uh, the 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 second to die spouse, um, most of what I'm saying here are the complications for the second. If it's the first to die spouse, usually the, the the surviving spouse will take care of a lot of this, and it's it's a lot less of a hassle because chances are the home, for example, will not have to be sold, and there won't be the the you know the issue with the utilities and all of that. But what I'm talking about here primarily is when the second to die spouse passes on and the home is now empty. And the, the big difference here with what you do for, what you may be familiar with in your own case, is to, to document, document, document. Uh, you need to do everything by the book. You, know, you need to interview at least three realtors and document what each of them says. And when you're signing the listing agreement, you probably want to pass all of this information through to the beneficiaries so they understand what you're doing or keep them up, up to date with, with, with uh, regular reports. Now you want to prepare for an open house, which usually means uh, retaining somebody to do the staging for the house. Um, you know, they are, they're going to say how all of the furniture should be arranged. All the knickknacks that the stager usually wants out of the way, you usually just box them up and put them in the garage. It's okay to have the garage cluttered, but everything else in the house needs to be free and clear and clean. Usually you want to have an estate sale. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, before you even have the estate sale, so if you go back to the letter of intent that we talked about earlier, that may say that you know that the picture over the mantel should should go to, to, to cousin Jack and that somebody else should should get uh, such such a set of knickknacks and so on. 
if these are a fairly fairly trivial monetary value, you want to get those out of the way as quickly and safely as you can, just to get them off the table, as it were. If they've got serious monetary value, the attorney may have some reservations about sending you know a ten thousand dollar painting uh, to cousin Jack that that that's to some extent shorting what what uh, Aunt Jane's going to receive. So you probably want to consult with him on that. But all the all the small stuff that's of minimal value, uh, you know that 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 should go to any of the uh, uh, the people called out in the letter of intent. Get it out of the way before something happens to it or before it gets lost. All of the you know the, the staging person's going to want to put a lot a lot of stuff you know in the garage, as I said. But then uh, you're going to want to have an estate sale, and the easiest way to do that is, is to talk to a number of uh, of estate sale agents. There are folks out there; they'll do it, but they're expensive. They will manage the whole thing for you. But typically, they get about 40% of the total proceeds. That's a fairly serious hit, but it may not be as bad as it sounds, frankly, because although most people would maybe dispute it initially, they think that the value of all the uh, artwork and knickknacks and ornaments and uh, jewelry and everything they have in the house that, uh, is very valuable. The reality is the total contents of the house, including furniture and everything, typically will sell for maybe ten thousand bucks. You know, it's not the hundred thousand bucks that people paid for it and think that it's worth. So, at an estate sale or even a garage sale that you run yourself, these are the prices you're going to expect to get. So, if the estate sale agents get you know forty four thousand bucks out of the ten thousand bucks and give you a check for for six thousand bucks, they will have earned every penny of that four thousand bucks. And uh, I personally think you do not want to get involved with that yourself. It's well worth it getting, letting them do all the work. Uh, if you do hire estate sale agents, you probably want to hold them responsible uh, for taking all of the unsold items to charity. You know, they, they typically hold uh, sales um, over the weekends, maybe on two consecutive weekends or something like that. But they eventually get to the point where or it's just not worth it for them or for you to keep doing open house or um, the, the, the sales and, and taking the time to do it. And you know the on the unsold stuff. You know the 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 the, the big old couch that nobody really wanted because it's got a, the wrong color for the living room or something. It should go to a charity, and you want to make, uh, if at all possible, have the estate sale agents responsible for trucking all this stuff over to the charity just to free up your own time. You're going to have more than enough to do yourself, so it, it's best to unload as much of this as you can. Any of the junk goes to the city dump, and again, you want to have them do that. And then the house has to be cleaned and, and set up uh, for flows of escrow. Flows of escrow is a, what you typically expect, except, well, again, except notify the beneficiaries of the terms of the sale. And what you really, really need to do, especially for the uh, fractional percentage beneficiaries, is to have them sign off their acceptance on, on the amount. And the problem there is that you're going to have the close of escrow scheduled for this Friday, and uh, you're not going to be the most popular person in the room when you say, oh, sorry, I can't do that. I have to contact the beneficiaries. That's going to take me two or three weeks to do that. And that's particularly true if some of the beneficiaries for the fractional amounts or the residual amounts are charities because the charity is going to push it immediately to their legal department and you can find yourself on the phone day after day after day trying to get a response from these guys so that you can close escrow. Meantime, the escrow, you know, the new buyer is breathing down your neck saying, hey, you know, you promised me escrow two weeks ago. I really, really want to get in there. I've sold my own place. I have nowhere to live. So it can complicate things a little bit. And you need to be careful how you handle all of that. But you have the privilege uh, of uh, reviewing all the closing documents and, and meeting with the title company and, and assigning everything. And again, don't forget to sign as trustee. Accounting issues go on forever, too. Um, you, you really want to work with an accountant for this. You know, initially to set up the uh, the value of the estate on, on on the day of death, but for on subsequent occasions as well, and for filing the tax returns and so on, it's usually best to work with an accountant that the estate uh, uh, attorney 
has recommended. You know, these guys work in pairs normally, and most uh, state attorneys are going to have a preferred accountant to work with. You know, they, they will work with other people, but it's a lot easier for you if, if you just uh, retain the guy that, that, that they're used to working with. Um, all of the uh, tax returns for the, uh, the, the, the uh, income tax and the state tax need to be filed. And you know, again, it's far, far easier to have the accountant do that and to try to even think of getting involved with it yourself. Um, I've said earlier that you really want to not close out the total account permanently for usually for three years in case the IRS files an audit. If you get audited and the IRS says, sorry, we've audited you know, the returns from last year and we find that you owe us $15,000 because the value of the, the, the you, know, you didn't declare the full value of the, uh, of the the home when it was sold or something. If you've already distributed all the assets to the beneficiaries, you now have the uh, choice of either trying to get them to pony up and pay some of it back to you, which they probably don't have the legal obligation to do, or funding the 15,000 bucks or whatever the audit amount is yourself. So the, the way to guard against that is, is to only distribute a portion of the assets initially and to retain typically 10, 15, 20, 20 percent, whatever the size of the estate is, retain at least, uh, again, it varies with the, the size of the estate, but 30, 40, 50,000 bucks in the trust so that if you are faced with an audit, you have enough in the trust to pay the, the uh, accountant to, to manage the audit for you and to pay whatever audit fees uh, uh, and penalties uh, that are, are due because of that. Uh, once the three-year period has passed, then you can uh, distribute all the rest of the the, uh, the remaining assets and close out the account. But the one thing I would stress here is at the bottom, keep meticulous records. Um, you know, every meeting, every email, every transaction, communicate, 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 because if you're challenged by any of the beneficiaries, you really want to have good documentation to support your, your decisions and your position. Some of the records you have to keep forever. You know, the, the, the original uh, trust and everything you should probably keep forever and also the tax returns in case of, of fraud. Question. Uh, this lady asks, is this three years a statutory law requirement or are you recommending it as something to be safe based on your experience. I'm going to hide behind my initial disclaimer and say I am not an attorney, so what I'm giving you is my best knowledge, but you, if it's an important thing, you should check, check with an attorney. I believe that, that the three years is, uh, is a federal and probably a state limit for most um, audits. However, if the IRS or the state has reason to suspect fraud. For any reason, if they suspect fraud, the three-year limit no longer applies and you no longer have any statute of limitations. If you're fairly sure that there's no reasonable case for fraud, then the three years is, is a reasonable guide. And some folks, to be safe, use seven years as a guide as well. That's perhaps overly conservative, but it depends on, on your confidence in the previous tax returns that have been filed to date. Uh, I've listed here the, some of the documents, uh, you know, how long they should be kept. Uh, again, this is a guideline. Most people would figure that, that keeping stuff for seven years is probably pretty safe. But don't forget, you're, you're going to have two or three, four boxes of stuff at this point. You can either store them in the back of a closet or somewhere uh, where, you know, where they'd be safe, or you may elect to store them off-site. But it's, they're, they're, it's a hassle, and again, it, you need to be fairly diligent when you're going through the documents initially on day one that you uh, only retain the stuff that, that, that you really think is important. Practical tips. Uh, document everything. If it isn't written down, it never happened. That, that's the golden rule, I think. Um, communicate frequently with the beneficiaries. As I said before, it's really worth your while to keep on keep these guys well informed because it's 
you're going to find a lot of the beneficiaries, they know of the debt, they know that they're in the will or the trust, and you're going to get phone calls, you're going to get emails and everything that says, you know, how much do I get and when do I get it? And you say, well, I can't tell you the exact number, but it's going to be roughly such and such, and you should be able to get it by the end of next month. If something happens, and they're going to be back on you three three weeks before the end of the month, thing. but you said, you said, then uh, it's really best to, to keep them up to date on what's actually happening, including any delays or setbacks. Be careful to disclose all major transactions, especially to the percentage beneficiaries, and get their written approval on it, uh, because, you know, the, the, a lot of these folks, when they're big dollars, uh, think in terms of, of, of legal actions, and uh, it, it really is safest. Your, your attorney, your state attorney, is actually going to recommend, maybe even insist, uh, that you get written approval. And he may even help uh, you know, send out the cover letters for these guys explaining what's happening. Specific beneficiaries that you know they get a you know twenty five thousand dollar check period or that get the vacation home or something. It's less important uh, to uh, get their approval because they don't have any uh, need to know and uh, for the uh, value of the estate and what's happening. <clears throat> I want to take a few minutes. We're running out of time here. It's going to go pretty quickly. Everybody recognizes we live in a, in a digital world. That includes emails and uh, online uh, accounts. Photo files are one of the big things that chew up a lot of space. But there's a ton of stuff here, and the question comes up, what do you want to happen to all this when you pass on? Uh, first question is, does your trustee have, have you given him enough information to access all of your digital accounts uh, you know, when you're no longer around? And one of the things I'm recommending here goes against all the all the normal rules. I'm saying keep a written list of all of your IDs and passwords in clear text. Put it in a safe place. You know, guard it with your life. But but your trustee is going to need to get into your Schwab account. And if you've got a whole bunch of photo files that are important to you and stuff like that, uh, he's going to need to get in there and decide which of those you want to close out, which of those you want to hang on to which ones are the important ones, and he's going to need all of, all of the, you know, your passwords without any guesswork and no fancy uh, uh, your algorithms for generating them because he may not uh, be in tune to your algorithm generator. So it's a, I think it's important to break all the rules, write them down, but then keep them in a safe place. Uh, make sure that the will or the trust gives your agent the uh, or the trustee the authority to deal with these accounts um, some folks like Facebook or LinkedIn or some other like that may not be thrilled if you pick up the phone and talk to them or if you try to go online and don't have the password and you say well you know he told me to do this this and this with the account or I just want to close it out um, it, it's useful to have at least a piece of paper somewhere that says that that was uh, the uh, the intent as a strategy, long-term strategy for handling your accounts, uh, I'm suggesting here that you organize everything and you back it all up. Uh, CDs and DVDs, flashcards, there may not be drives available 10, 15, 20 years from now. And anybody who backed up their accounts 10 years ago on floppy disks may be wondering what to do with them at this point. Um, probably the safest thing is to, is to back them up on Google Drive or Carbonite or some, some of those uh, cloud services because they will probably accept the responsibility of switching over uh, you know, as, as the, uh, the formats change and you won't be stuck with it. But again, make sure that, the, the, that all of the data is well protected with strong passwords and keep a, a list locked in a secure place. Um, yeah, the, the, well, the bottom thing here just says make sure that, that your agent know, knows where to fi find all this because if, if it's hidden somewhere and it, and it takes a month for someone to find it, you could be really struggling in the meantime. Make your life easy, easy for your agent. And that's really what the All About Me folder is, is for. Besides you know, putting in a lot of the legal documents, put enough in there so that your, your agent, uh, be the trustee or the executor or uh, your power of attorney, uh, has enough information to manage that all for you. Um, you should collect all of the all of the documents into a, into a 
large ring book because at this point I think a simple folder is no longer going to do it. It should be secured in a in a, in a clean, dry place. Um, do not put it into a bank deposit box unless that box happens to be owned jointly or you know, the, the joint tenants and, and co or joint tenants or or not tenants and common joint tenancy. Uh, or if it's held in the name of a trust, because otherwise you won't have access to it. You've got to go to a court to get permission to access it. And again, you're talking weeks or maybe even months. So store it typically in a in a fire safe at home or somewhere like that. But make sure that your that your executor knows where it is and how to how to access it. Uh, you should include all of your estate planning documents, all the stuff that we've talked about here. Uh, you know, including your letter of intent, maybe the letter of intent, which should be at the very first top of the file, so that it's a way of telling your trustee, you know, just giving him an overview of what your mindset is. That also includes the any uh, funeral arrangements you may have already made. Should include all of the financial planning documents. Remember those folks who have followed this series were all the way from from workshop one. We talked about uh, investing. We talked about the personal investing investor profile, the PIP, which really defines, answers the who am I question from the, for an investor. And then the investment policy statement answers the, the question, to you, how do you want it managed, where and when, and the, all the other questions. Uh, you should keep track of your non-deductible IRAs because they will have a cost basis that, you know, that, that, that can uh, minimize the, uh, the, the capital gains, or it won't be capital gains, the income tax that paid ordinary income tax paid on, on your IRA. That we covered quite briefly in, in workshop five. Um, it may be useful on an annual basis to include your, your bank and brokerage statements because that will have all the account numbers and, and, and so on on there, contacts on there, um, all of your websites, um, every, everything to, to, to make the life for your trustee easier. Uh, you should include uh, some information on healthcare issues, your general general health issues, and also who's your primary doctor and your specialist. Enough contact information for them. Uh, what medications you're on, stuff like that. Uh, you should, uh, as I mentioned earlier, include a, a HIPAA release so that you can talk to the doctor. Uh, he, or more importantly, he can talk to you uh, with the with the HIPAA release. Should include contact information for all the professional and personal people in your life. Again, you know, don't go we'll have to to dig all this out you know, the hard way. Uh, we've already talked about the uh, account ID and passwords, and uh, just mentioning some of the you know accounts and websites and so on here that you need to include on that list. Um, you should include. Uh, Copies of things like your uh, driver's license and your social security card, Medicare card, uh, probably the ID page and your passport, port, birth certificates, marriage certificates, all all the stuff that that documents your life. Uh, again, uh, you know, things like military records. All of this may be useful to your trustee. And you know, the mortuary, for example, is going to need copies of photo uh, copies of your driver's license before they will. Uh, release the the remains for cremation. So you you want to don't don't leave your trustee scrambling to get stuff like this. Uh, you should review the plan on a regular basis. Typically, the attorneys will say every three to five years. But if any of these uh, items here you know show up on it, if there's any change in status, uh, you should uh, review it immediately. I've given you a list of references here. Um, there's tons of reading out there. This is just a, a very short list of things you may want to get started on. I've given you websites. And again, there's a whole ton of information. Uh, you, you can spend hours, days, weeks uh, going through all this, but uh, hopefully you've got enough here to, to get you started. And we have the mandatory cartoon to end the show. Raising, raising my allowance is fine, Dad. But what I'm really after is power of attorney. I think that says it all. If there are any other questions remaining at this point, I'll be glad to take them now. Or if you want to email me at the email address that I gave you on the title slide, I'll be glad to cover those. If there are no questions, then 
over and out. Thank you, folks, who have enjoyed giving this series. I hope that uh, that you all got something useful out of it, and uh, stay in touch. Thank you.